Welcome to the Department of Medicine Ground Rounds. At the entrance, you should have received this, which is for the faculty. Do you have one? Show me. Okay. Um, and this is the Internal Medicine Residency Training Program Faculty Survey. Some of you or all of you should have filled a survey, electronic survey, that deals with the training program. This is our internal survey, but it has to be done because we need to send a report about our internal survey to ACGME. So please take the time to fill this up and leave it when you leave. Um, I very much appreciate it. Yes? Okay. Okay. So there you go. Today is an interesting day. Uh, in 1964 was the death of Gerard Domag, D-O-M-A-G-K, who was a German bacteriologist and pathologist who was awarded the 1939 Nobel Prize of Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of Prontosil, which was an antibacterial drug, the first of the sulfonamide drugs. And what was interesting about this is that he was in a concentration camp. And he was awarded the prize despite the fact that the Nazi government actually sent a letter to the Nobel Prize Committee telling them that we didn't want this award. Of course, Hitler was very unhappy that this person in a concentration camp had been awarded. And in fact, award actually refused the award. It was the first refusal in the history of the Nobel Prize awards. Um, but after the fall of Hitler and in 1947, Domak was able to travel to Stockholm and accept the award. On this week, also in 1909, was the birth of Rita Levy Montalcini. I don't know if Dr. Roberto Boli knows her, but basically she won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1986 with Stanley Cohen for the discovery of nerve growth factor. Now, when she was younger, in Italy, as a Jew, during World War II, uh, by Mussolini's law, she was not allowed an academic career. So she went home and set up her own laboratory where she studied chicken embryos and studied the growth of nerves uh, in the chicken embryos at home, in her own laboratory, in the backyard. Arthur Galston was born in 1920 this week. He was a plant pathologist and biologist who discovered Agent Orange, and despite his warnings and his concerns and his uh, work against it, the military used it extensively as a defoliant in Vietnam War, and Galston spent a lot of his time lobbying against it until he got Nixon to uh, stop using it in, in Vietnam. But today is about the circulation, cardiovascular system, and today was the birth or I guess two days ago was the birth in 1797 of Jean Poiseuille. And Dr. Poisson was a French physician and physiologist who contributed to the knowledge of blood circulation through arteries and actually did a lot of work that led to the formulation of an equation. Some call it the Poisson equation, some call it the Hagen Poisson equation. Dr. Hagen discovered it separately. And, and it relates to the flow rate and to fluid viscosity. Uh, but Poisson was also believed to be the first to use mercury manometer to measure blood pressure, which is an interesting thing. I, di I didn't know that. So with that, I'll leave you with Dr. Roberto Boli, the Chief of Cardiology, who's going to introduce our speaker of the day. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, which is well known to all of you, Steve Wagner. Uh, Steve has been at UVL uh, basically forever. Uh, there are rumors that he was on the beach on that fateful Sunday morning on October 12, 1492, when Columbus landed. And he was uh, interviewing his crewmen because he needed a non-invasive fellow at the VA. <laughs> now, seriously, Steve has been, um, I think uh, we just we were talking, he's the second longest serving member of the Department of Medicine. So he graduated from the University of Rochester back in 69, had his medicine residency at Georgetown University and University of California, San Francisco, had his cardiology fellowship um, also at the University of California, San Francisco, followed by a nuclear cardiology fellowship, moved to the East Coast in, uh, at UNC, University of North Carolina, for a couple of years, and then went back to San Francisco as um, a clinical associate professor working at um, the um, Kaiser Foundation Hospital in Oakland, California until 1990. In 1990, he moved to Louisville, 
was assistant professor promoted to associate professor and has been here ever since. Uh, Steve has been uh, a loyal and a valuable member of our division for 24 years. He has uh, played uh, several very important roles as director of the cardiology training program, as a chief of cardiology at the VA, and uh, as director of nuclear cardiology. He has uh, gained respect as uh, an outstanding clinician with, uh, with really great, excellent clinical judgment. Uh, he is, uh, um, a, has been consistently a great team player um, in many situations, always willing to help us and work with us. Uh, and has been a great source of advice uh, over the years. So I would like to take this opportunity to recognize your long-standing service at uh, UVL and the Division of Cardiology and all you have done. Steve has done a lot of things behind the scenes for which he has not go gotten a lot of credit or recognition. Uh, and so we want to thank you, Steve, for all you have done for all these years for cardiology. And today we look forward to your uh, discussion of the controversial uh, new guidelines on uh, uh, lowering of uh, blood cholesterol. Thank you very much, and um, I'm uh, pleased to be here. Um, so at, at the beginning of this talk, I, I should point out that these uh, new guidelines that were published online in November of 2013 uh, strike me as being one of the more controversial, one of the more uh, media attention-grabbing uh, effort uh, put forth by the uh, cardiology scientific community. And just looking at the number of uh, papers and publications, it's, it's remarkable. Um, uh, over the past uh, several months, uh, there's been three papers in uh, JAMA, in one issue of JAMA, uh, four papers in an issue of the Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, there was another uh, review article in New England Journal, which I just got uh, two days ago. So let's go over uh, wh why, why the controversy and what it all means. I have no disclosures to make. And I'm going to start out with two cases which I uh, will introduce now but then discuss towards the end of the talk. So the first is a 60-year-old African-American woman seen in the prevention clinic concerned about her stroke risk. Her mother had diabetes and a stroke at age 62. Patient's a non-smoker, BMI 31, blood pressure 142 over 88 on two antihypertensive medications. The lab values are significant for a fasting blood sugar of 109, hemoglobin A1C of 5.9, uh, putting her in the um, insulin resistant, uh, maybe pre diabetic category. Total cholesterol 200, triglycerides 100, HDL cholesterol 55, LDL cholesterol 125, and the non HDL cholesterol 145. Non-HDL is a simple calculation where you subtract from the total cholesterol the HDL cholesterol. Second case is a 71-year-old non-Hispanic white male referred to the Lipid Clinic. He has uh, insulin uh, requiring diabetes with a past medical history of bypass surgery and peripheral vascular disease surgery. BMI is 38.4. At uh, the time that he was uh, seen, he was already on pravastatin, 40 milligrams, gemfibrozole, 600 milligrams twice a day, and he had no past history of statin intolerance. His labs revealed a hemoglobin A1C of 9.2%. His uh, liver transaminases were normal, TSH normal. Lipids, total cholesterol, 121, triglycerides, 568. HDL 19 and LDL was not calculated. Um, most labs uh, that use the Friedwald equation will not calculate uh, an LDL when the triglyceride levels are over 400 because it becomes increasingly uh, inaccurate. His non-HDL cholesterol, however, could be calculated 
and was 102. So we'll start out with the, a little bit of history with the background, uh, um, looking at the uh, lipid hypothesis, basically the relationship between cholesterol intake, cholesterol levels, and atherosclerotic uh, disease. So uh, the, the f figure on the right is uh, from one of the seven countries studied by Ansel Keys and uh, with uh, publishing in this particular paper in 1970. And it basically shows the linear relationship between cholesterol intake, cholesterol levels, and uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes in, a, in seven countries and, and uh, populations from various parts of the uh, different countries. The uh, first study to show benefit of uh, pharmacotherapy was the study using uh, the bile acid sequestering cholesterol. Um, men with primary hypercholesterolemia were randomized to placebo or to the drug, and they found a 12% reduction in LDL and a 19% reduction in coronary heart disease events after seven years of follow-up. What's of interest for anybody that's uh, prescribed or tried the bile acid sequestrants, their target was 25 grams but they were only able to uh, get on average 12 and a half grams in their subjects. Um, the National Cholesterol Education Program started in uh, 1985. The first statin, lovastatin, was uh, released in 1987. It was derived from a uh, um, metabolite of uh, fungus. And the landmark uh, statin trials uh, started in the early 90s. And they, uh, the ones listed here show a range of mortality reduction between 13 and uh, 30 percent. So what we were operating on until recently was the adult treatment panel three recommendations, which came out in 2001. So basically on the left was the uh, list of the major uh, clinical risk factors, which you can see. And these are uh, the standard ones that we're all familiar with. Uh, on the right was the uh, variables that went into the Framingham risk score, which was a calculated 10-year uh, risk. And. Um, what, what, what we see on the upper left is relationship uh, between the risk factors, the Framingham risk score, and the LDL uh, goals. So over the years, the various ATP programs had increasing uh, emphasis on LDL cholesterol as targets for treatment. So for two or more risk factors, you would then apply the Framingham risk score if it was less than 20% uh, 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 over 10 years, uh, then the target was one, less than 130. If your Framingham risk score was uh, greater than 20% chance of a coronary event over 10 years, uh, then the target was 100. Triglycerides were felt to, to be uh, to a, a secondary target. Um, and uh, if the uh, triglycerides were over 200, even uh, after uh, uh, on a uh, lipid, uh, on a uh, statin, uh, then the recommendation was to add uh, nicotinic acid or fibrate uh, on top of it. If triglycerides were greater than 500, the first target was to lower it below 500, not for lipids, but to a prevent uh, pancreatitis, although clinically uh, pancreatitis is usually not a concern until it's much higher. So that uh, was essentially what we were operating on until uh, a revision of these guidelines in 2004 where they established uh, an even lower target uh, based on the presence of these four uh, groups. So established cardiovascular disease, so secondary prevention with multiple risk factors, 
including diabetes or smoking, uh, risk factors uh, uh, making up the metabolic syndrome in patients with acute coronary syndromes. Now, uh, the first uh, evidence of questioning the idea of LDL targets came out in a publication in the Annals in 2006. Uh, the lead author uh, was a uh, epidemiologist at the uh, uh, Ann Arbor VA University of Michigan, and they uh, analyzed uh, the data looking at some of the uh, studies that the ATP3 panel used to uh, select lower LDL as targets. And what they found as listed on the right was their review found no high quality evidence to support the current treatment goals for LDL cholesterol. No valid clinical evidence to suggest that treatments other than statins uh, are safe or effective. The current evidence supports ignoring LDL cholesterol altogether and titrating to higher doses of statins as tolerated and uh, 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 a foundation of, of this hypothesis was the uh, observation of the so-called pleiotropic or non-lipid lowering effects of statins. Um, and if, if, if in fact statins have effects other than lipid lowering, then the relative benefits of statin therapy should be independent of baseline LDL cholesterol. And that's in fact uh, what they found when they uh, analyzed some studies that, uh, for example, the Prove It and Heart Protection Trial, which are shown here, were used by the ATP3 panel to uh, argue for lowering the LDL targets. But in fact, for example, here in the, uh, in the uh, uh, figure on the right, when they analyzed the, the, the results and compared the uh, pre-randomization LDL cholesterol levels and the percentage drop, they found no significant difference uh, in the uh, where the uh, post-treatment LDL levels uh, landed and the uh, effect on reducing the events. Uh, a follow-up uh, publication in 2012 with the same uh, uh, Dr. Hayward and then uh, with uh, Dr. Krumholtz as a co-author. Um, basically uh, did uh, further reviews and came up with the same conclusion. No scientific basis to supporting uh, treating to LDL targets. Again, they emphasized uh, the pleiotropic, in anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, antioxidative, uh, the safety of treating to targets had never been proved and they favored tailored treatment, uh, statin treatment intensity based on a five to 10 year risk, a simpler, safer, more effective, and more evidence-based approach. Interestingly, uh, these arguments are echoed in the current guidelines. Um, the VA, uh, which is the country's largest integrated healthcare system providing care to a over 8 million veterans. Uh, a year and a half before the new guidelines were released, uh, changed uh, their national VA formulary recommendation about treating uh, patients with uh, high risk. And uh, what they instituted was a change in goals. So there were two choices, either putting the patient on a moderate dose statin, which reduced the LDL by 30 to 40% on average, or you could treat to target at an LDL level less than 100. So the uh, process, the evolution of uh, going from ATP3 uh, started in uh, 2007 uh, with the uh, uh, meeting of uh, experts to uh, discuss what changes might be made. Um, in 2011, the Institute of Medicine, uh, at the request of Congress, uh, 
did a report establishing best practice standards for generating systematic evidence reviews and practice guidelines. And uh, their emphasis on, uh, on high quality evidence, which, be, which would be randomized controlled trials uh, or meta-analyses based on these uh, randomized controlled trials. The NIH uh, uh, took that up uh, in their review, but in June of uh, last year, the NIH decided to collaborate with the uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and uh, essentially uh, delegated the uh, final uh, guidelines to uh, the ACC AHA. And that's uh, what we are working with. So I'm going to review uh, some of the features of the new guidelines published online in November. First, with respect to treat to target, they uh, more or less ad uh, adopted the uh, same arguments that uh, had been made in the previous papers I uh, mentioned. Current clinical trial data do not indicate what target should be an unknown magnitude of risk reduction with lower targets. The idea of lower the better does not consider potential adverse effects of multidrug therapy. Now there's been uh, considerable interest about uh, the uh, role genetics play and uh, the lifetime risk of coronary disease is uh, particularly important in patients that have uh, a strong uh, genetic predisposition. And there have been a number of uh, papers looking at the genetics and using Mendelian randomization, uh, uh, sort of an experiment by nature, where people will throughout their life be exposed to high lipid levels. But nevertheless, uh, the panel felt that the lack of data on the long-term follow-up of uh, randomized trials more than 10 years, the safety when statins are used for more than 10 years, and the treatment of individuals less than age 40, that they um, were unwilling at this time to make strong recommendations for therapy. So the focus in these guidelines are four statin benefit groups based on a comprehensive set of data from randomized controlled trials. And um, they emphasized, as all the other guidelines have, uh, and the essential importance of lifestyle modifications, a dash light diet uh, with strong Mediterranean diet features, regular, moderate to vigorous physical activity. So they, they didn't ignore that part of it. They identified high intensity and moderate intensity statin therapy for use in primary and secondary hypertension. So just to review uh, the definition, so high intensity statin therapy is a daily dose in uh, someone not on medication that will reduce on average at least uh, 50 percent. Uh, and uh, you can achieve that with a torvastatin in the 40 to 80 milligram range, resuvastatin in the 20 to 40 milligram range. Uh, moderate intensity is a reduction of between 30 and 50 percent, and as you can see here, listed the uh, doses for the uh, various uh, statins. Uh, low intensity is uh, less than a 30 percent reduction. So let's uh, re review what these four groups are, and then we'll discuss each uh, individually. So the first is the uh, secondary prevention, individuals with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, what's different about these guidelines is their definition of ASCVD includes stroke, in addition to the usual uh, factors of coronary or peripheral vascular arterial disease. Uh, the other uh, important thing was they excluded from this category patients that had uh, known uh, vascular disease but also had class 2 to 4 heart failure or uh, were on dialysis. And it's 
seems uh, uh, strange to uh, uh, put that uh, addendum on that group, but this was based on the fact that there's insufficient data showing benefit of statins in those groups. So they're not saying to not use them, but they're saying there's insufficient data for them to include it as a strong recommendation. Group two are individuals 21 age, uh, years of age or older who have familial hypercholesterolemia with primary elevations of their LDL cholesterol greater than 190. The third uh, group, which is uh, also primary care, um, primary prevention, individuals in the 40 to 75 years of age. Uh, the bottom 40 is because, again, the lack of data on, uh, on individuals less than age 40 and 75 as the upper limit because, again, there are fewer studies with uh, uh, less data on the older population. Uh, so these are uh, patients with uh, diabetes. Their LDL cholesterol is in the 70 to 189 uh, range. So uh, less than 70, they would not fall into that category, but we'll see with an, some exceptions. The last group is the, is in a way the most important because it's the most controversial was the uh, primary prevention individuals without disease uh, or diabetes in that same age range with the same lipid range with an estimated 10 year risk of 7.5% or higher. And as we'll talk about this risk is derived from the application of the pooled cohort equations a risk calculator. Remember that the Framingham risk score considered high risk greater than 20% uh, over a 10 year period. They also had a new perspective on using LDL and non-HDL cholesterol as treatment goals. They found no good evidence to support the continued use of these goals. They felt the appropriate intensity of statin therapy should be used and uh, they defined it in the group most likely to benefit, that, that is the high risk group, high risk in terms of multiple risk factors, not just their lipids. And uh, that non-statin therapies do not provide acceptable risk reduction benefits compared with their potential for adverse effects in the routine prevention of uh, coronary and uh, disease and stroke. Now, the, the, these recommendations were based on review of studies. AIM High Trial was uh, one in particular where uh, the combination of adding uh, uh, long-acting niacin to a statin uh, was compared with uh, statin alone, and they showed even though the LDL cholesterols were reduced to the 40 to 80 milligram range, there was uh, no uh, incremental uh, reduction in, in risk and, and, in fact, lots more uh, side effects with the use of statin. The Accord trial uh, where they uh, added uh, phenofibrate uh, to a, a statin demonstrated futility in diabetics except for a subgroup analysis that, that showed those with high triglycerides and low HDL levels uh, appeared to have a, a benefit but they viewed this finding as hypothesis generating at, at the present time. So in terms of this global risk assessment, uh, this was the, uh, the uh, pooled correlated equations that they developed. One of the new features was they uh, made it specific for either uh, white, non-Hispanic, or, uh, or, or African-American uh, because there's a difference in the uh, risk outcomes in these two uh, groups of, uh, of uh, individuals. Um, as mentioned before, they wanted to focus on those most likely to benefit and uh, exclude those where the data shows that they may not benefit. Importantly, and they emphasize this uh, repeatedly, that before initiating statin therapy, the guidelines recommend a discussion by clinicians and their patients. And we'll hear this over and over. So-called patient-centered approach 
has a, uh, a major role. They're concerned about safety when you talk about using statins. And mm, sorry about that. The authors of the guidelines. They did it. It should be plugged in. Well, let's let's I'll go fast. Hope it stays up. <laughs> so safety is important when you talk about using statins, and they use randomized controlled trials to uh, determine the adverse effects and to provide expert guidance on management of statin-associated adverse effects. Uh, the most common being muscle symptoms. So uh, what about uh, uh, many of the things that uh, have generated lots of interest uh, recently, which is the use of biomarkers, non-invasive imaging to determine someone's uh, risk. And what they, uh, uh, their position on this was that treatment decisions in individuals who are not included in the four statin benefit groups may be informed by using other factors. And that includes an LDL cholesterol greater than 160, family history of premature disease, CRP level greater than two, coronary calcium score that's elevated, uh, ABIs less than 0.9 or, or elevated uh, risk. So they give you some options in patients that uh, are in the intermediate risk category. What didn't they include? Treatment of complex lipid disorders and individuals with comorbidities that would have not been included in the randomized controlled trials and they felt was beyond the scope of these guidelines. They again referred to expert clinical judgment needed to manage these patients. Uh, they also looked to the future and um, they felt that at, at the moment, uh, these were comprehensive guidelines, but updates will build on the foundation to uh, manage complex lipid disorders, uh, incorporate refinements and risk stratification, uh, and uh, have uh, future evidence-based guidelines. So uh, I think that uh, they wanted to avoid what we all were uh, faced with was a 12-year period between uh, the uh, last and the current guidelines. So let's talk about the four uh, patient benefit groups, starting in group one, the uh, secondary prevention. We already uh, uh, reviewed that high-intensity statin therapy for adults up to the age of 75, not already on a statin, um, is the uh, goal or if they're on a low to moderate intensity statin, it should be increased to high intensity unless there's intolerance or safety issues. Whether someone who's already on 40 milligrams of ortorvastatin should be up titrated based on the potential benefits and risks. Moderate intensity statin should be considered for those greater than age 75, and again, based on risk benefits. The second category are those uh, with evidence of familial hypercholesterolemia or triglycerides greater than uh, 500 um, and uh, older than age 21. Now, in, in this case, you can see, I'm sorry. I don't know why. I may need some help here with the power. Um, let's see where we left off. Uh, this is the uh, group that has, uh, at age 21, with familiar hypercholesterolemia or elevated uh, triglycerides greater than 500. Uh, one of the uh, first steps is to look for secondary causes uh, that, uh, that could be modified. 
It looks like the plugging in is not getting any power. The, the guidelines allow, uh, in these cases, uh, treatment beyond statin. So you can add non-statin therapy in those visuals, particularly the familial hypercholesterolemic patients, or in those with triglycerides greater than 500. Uh, I think you're, I mean, you think the power's dead on your computer. Do you have a, you have a. Uh, I have a flash drive. I know, do you, do you have a, a, a AC cord? A power yeah. cord? Yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of, uh, let's see if I can remember the slide. So in terms of, of uh, the next category, which was the, the role of biomarkers, that, as uh, previously I alluded to, uh, none of these uh, uh, ancillary biomarkers are considered to be essential to the uh, initial treatment, but could be used in those uh, patients that have an intermediate uh, risk. I didn't think you, the battery died, so it's going to have to boot it back up here. So what died? The battery, the laptop battery. Close it, I was worried about it. <laughs> yeah. but, but even... It's, Even it, plugged in that thing it's fine. It should be fine now. Yeah. Once it gets back, yeah. once it gets back in. Okay. Come back to the same? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if we'll come back to the slide you stopped on, but. Uh... All right, I apologize for the delay. So the third category are, are those uh, primary prevention uh, individuals uh, that have diabetes. And with the uh, restrictions of their age between 40 and 75 and their LDL cholesterol level is listed. So giving a, ma a maximally tolerated statin uh, should receive primary uh, emphasis uh, use a moderate intensity statin if their 10-year risk is less than 7.5% and the high intensity for those higher. They point out that uh, individuals with diabetes uh, often have lower LDL cholesterols uh, and that, uh, however, that uh, the evidence still does not support reducing the statin dose uh, except for safety issues um, because of that. So they still are recommending a primary statin treatment for those uh, diabetics with lower LDL levels. So in this group, they can be identified by using the new pooled cohort equations. 
and uh, they are uh, using the uh, S the absolute risk uh, to guide the initiation of statin therapies. Again, lifetime counseling should occur at the initial and follow-up visits, and they emphasize the guidelines are patient-centered. So this is an example of uh, one of the online uh, uh, formats for the uh, pooled uh, calculator. Uh, they, they, obviously, they have apps for uh, uh, smartphones as well. So uh, again, this is intended for use if there is no atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and an LDL is below 190. Now, the optimal risk factors, so the lowest you can have um, based on your age would be total cholesterol 170, HDL of 50 or higher, blood pressure of 110, no medications for hypertension, non-diabetic, non-smoker. They will only uh, calculate the lifetime risk estimate for individuals in the 20 to 59 year age. So this example is for a 63 year old male. Um, I think as you can see here, uh, that risk is 7.5% if, if that person had no uh, uh, other uh, risk factors. And that's been one of the things that caught everybody's attention was simply being a 63-year-old uh, white male uh, put you in the high uh, risk category. Uh, so we put in those numbers and the 10-year risk in that particular person was 9.6%. They didn't give an, a lifetime risk because the age exceeded that group. So uh, this is the uh, pooled cohort equation. It's generated so much of the controversy and uh, within the same month uh, that this was published, a paper came out in uh, Lancet, which was applying uh, these new guidelines to uh, three primary prevention trials that, that were held at the Brigham. And uh, by using that analysis, they found that these current guidelines overestimated the risk by 75 to 150%. There's been a number of papers since then uh, showing uh, similar evidence that these new guidelines overestimate the risk in primary prevention. This was a, 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 a paper in, in New England Journal uh, that uh, used uh, the N. Haynes uh, data. And as you can see on the right, uh, the difference using the ATP3 and AHA, ACC, was uh, much smaller in, in the younger age group, but the real difference uh, in overestimation occurred in the 60 to 75 group. So if they uh, extrapolated the results to a population of 150 million adults uh, that would be eligible for statins, uh, applying the new guidelines would increase the, the recommendation up to 87% and in men and up to 53% in women. And so this is a recurring theme in terms of criticisms of, of the guidelines is uh, it uh, could lead to the uh, statinization of America. <laughs> the authors estimated uh, the, the uh, effect on future uh, events and they projected that 11.4 million new cases would occur over the next 10 years 1.9 million more adults would be eligible for statins. And it may or may not be a, a, a bad thing. So uh, uh, the one paper that, uh, that, that found different results, uh, they looked at the REGARDS trial, which was a uh, primary prevention for, uh, uh, to prevent stroke, and using those patients uh, they analyzed uh, the adults in that age range, which uh, would have uh, been uh, applicable for the ACC AHA pool cohort risk equations. And uh, as opposed to other studies, they found pretty good correlation between the observed and, pre and predicted uh, event rate. 
So the uh, risk equations were well calibrated and had moderate to good discrimination. Even that, however, created controversy because two of the authors on this uh, paper were also in the working group that devised the new uh, Poolhort equations. And uh, this uh, study only had a five-year follow-up because they uh, were using a, a much more current uh, group um, and uh, the authors uh, have uh, made their own uh, rebuttal to some of the criticisms. Uh, in primary prevention, whether or not to write a stat prescription is based on the risk and discussion with the patients. Risk score is the start of the discussion, not the end. According to the CDC, if one out of three Americans will die from heart disease or stroke and 60% will experience a major event, so according to this, the NHANES data, if statins reduce the relative risk by 25%, which is what was found in, in, a, in a, a, a well done meta-analysis, uh, uh, that a, a close to 500,000 future events will be presented, prevented and 90% would occur in older adults. Now, they also uh, point out that the equations could be modified, expanded over time. So let's go back to the uh, uh, issues of statin safety. Since we, uh, if we accept these guidelines, we're going to be recommending statins far more commonly than we have before. So as I mentioned, no recommendation for the group of uh, patients with heart failure or on dialysis, it's a category X for pregnancy. Clinical judgment is important for the patient groups uh, younger, uh, greater than age 40, even though they have a high lifetime risk. Are those with serious comorbidities, such as HIV, uh, diseases that predispose to muscle symptoms, rheumatologic or inflammatory, or those who've undergone an organ uh, transplant and on uh, immunosuppressant therapy because of the drug-drug interactions with statins. So the current uh, data regarding uh, side effects, myopathy occurs, will uh, uh, occur, will yield 0 0.01 excess cases per 100. Diabetes, uh, for moderate intent, new onset diabetes for moderate intensity, 0.1 individuals per 100 per year, and for a high intensity is 0.3. Hemorrhagic stroke is also uh, very low in the serious myopathy or rhabdo range, which is the 0.01. So characteristic predisposing to effects, we mentioned the comorbidities, uh, elevated uh, uh, hepatic transaminases, uh, greater than three times upper limits of normal, drug-drug interactions, age greater than 75. Uh, how low can you go before you're concerned about a statin? Well, based on one study, the IDEAL trial, where they uh, uh, were uh, uh, able to uh, increase the dose of statin, uh, if the LDL cholesterol was below 40, they recommended a repeat, and if it was still below 40, then to modify the statin dose. That's the only lower limit that the uh, committee uh, discusses. 80 milligrams of statin should be avoided because of its greatly increased risk of um, serious myopathy compared to all the other statins. <laughs> Um, there's some uh, concern about cognitive dysfunction in patients on statin, uh, but that has not been definitively shown in, uh, in, uh, in randomized trials. But uh, there is a, a consideration for stopping the statin if it appears there's no other explanation. The one uh, factor that's reassuring is it appears to be totally reversible once the statin is discontinued. Uh, if muscle symptoms develop, look for other underlying causes, hypothyroid, renal hepatic function. Interestingly, uh, vitamin D deficiency is, uh, has been described in patients more likely to get statin side effects and replacing uh, 
uh, the, those levels appears to minimize those effects. Uh, what about the use of non-statins, adding, adding it or using it in, in uh, statin intolerant individuals? Avoid the bile acid sequestrants because, uh, because of their triglyceride raising properties when the triglyceride is greater than 300. Gemfibrozole is, should not be used in combination therapy period because of its high drug-drug interaction. Phenofibrate, as the fibrate can be considered in lower moderate intensity statin when the triglycerides are greater than 500. Niacin shouldn't be used if there's elevated liver enzymes, cutaneous symptoms, hyperglycemia, even atrial fibrillation have been described uh, as side effects in the AIM uh, high trial. So if the triglycerides are greater than 500, the guidelines refer to American Heart Association physician paper on the management of hypertriglyceridemia published in circulation in 2011. So the table on the left shows the effect of nutritional changes and you can lower the triglycerides up to 50% by initiating the various uh, dietary and exercise uh, factors. On the right is the average uh, reduction in triglycerides with the various drugs, uh, fibrates, uh, uh, have the uh, highest uh, effect. Notice, however, that statins in the 10 to 30 percent range are no different than extended release uh, niacin. So let's go back to the cases I originally discussed. So the first is the 60 year old uh, African American woman concerned about a stroke. Uh, Total cholesterol 200, triglycerides 100, HDL 55, LDL 125. So if we use the old ATP3 uh, 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 algorithm, uh, she had two major risk factors, her blood pressure of 140 or greater and an age greater in a woman greater than 55. So her 10-year Framingham risk score was 3%. Um, based on that, her LDL target would be less than 130. And interestingly, her target for advising uh, therapeutic lifestyle changes would be less than 130 as well. So according to ATP3, not only does she not get uh, statin therapy, we don't even tell her uh, the benefits of lifestyle changes. Of course, we would do it anyway. Uh, other concerns about the ATP3 guidelines in this particular patient is it doesn't consider stroke as an outcome. It didn't look at studies that use stroke as an outcome. And that, and that population was derived uh, from uh, uh, whites and not African Americans. So using the new guidelines and using the pooled cohort equation, their 10-year risk, including stroke, would be 8.7% which would put her in the uh, category of primary prevention. And based on the studies listed below, uh, they have shown that there's a benefit of uh, statins reducing uh, events across the range of LDLs uh, as long as they're greater than 70. African-American women have a higher risk than, uh, than white women. Women are more likely to have a stroke as the first manifestation of atherosclerotic disease and statins show a significant reduction in stroke development. So uh, the recommendations in her would be a moderate to high intensity statin. Now a concern is she's already at high risk for the development of diabetes based on her uh, evidence uh, for insulin resistance. Uh, Modern intensity statin results in one excess case of new diabetes per 1,000 persons treated per year. Uh, however, if you look at their uh, prevention of an atherosclerotic event, it's 5.4%. Uh, so the net benefit is there. Now, uh, uh, the Jupiter trial uh, was uh, the, the one that uh, um, was most convincing that there seems to be a 
uh, a predisposition to development of a new uh, onset diabetes in patients already at risk for it. But uh, all those in the Jupiter trial that went on to develop it, uh, diabetes during the trial had uh, evidence of insulin resistance beforehand. So the idea is that these would be people that would have, if their risk factors remained unchanged, developed diabetes for, uh, at some point a little bit later. Um, there, however, is uh, uh, considerable interest in looking at that in more detail in the future. Second case, and uh, this patient was referred to the uh, lipid clinic at the VA at this point. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, the expert uh, uh, collaboration I've had with Brenda Underwood, who is the cardiac nurse practitioner at the VA and with whom I work in the lipid clinic and the cardiac rehab program. So this patient was referred to the lipid clinic. Uh, he has uh, a hemoglobin A1C of 9.2% supposedly on insulin therapy, no obvious contraindications to statins. Uh, his total cholesterol was 121, triglycerides 568, HDL 19, LDL not calculated, non-HDL cholesterol 102. Um, he did have chronic kidney disease. Now, using ATP3, because the triglycerides were greater than 500, the first step was to uh, reduce them below 500, then use a target LDL less than 70. If that was not reached, then you could add additional medications to reduce the non-HL cholesterol below 100. You could use statin monotherapy or combination therapy. Per uh, the, the new guidelines, uh, there are no, as we mentioned, no specific tr trials addressing LDL or non-HDL targets. For secondary prevention, at least moderate intensity statin should be used, but we don't have uh, a uh, LDL cholesterol level, uh, at least by calculating uh, using the Friedwald equation. Uh, if we used uh, a surrogate, which would be the non-HDL cholesterol, that target would be below 100. His uh, non-HDL was 102. So according to the uh, guidelines on management of triglyceride, we look for secondary causes. In his case, weight gain, high carbohydrate intake, excessive alcohol use, beta blockers. Interesting, uh, carvedilol appears to not uh, share that uh, class effect. Uh, and chronic kidney disease uh, um, can play a role in terms of safety issues. Gemfibrazole should not be combined with a statin, so that was a concern. Phenofibrates contraindicated if the estimated GFR is below 30. His was 28, and, uh, and uh, phenofibrate can deteriorate renal function. Niacin increases. Uh, the fasting sugar by four to five percent and has been shown to have no added benefit in two recent trials. So the recommendation in this patient was lifestyle changes, a major importance, better blood sugar control. Uh, we recommended stopping the gemfibrazole, reducing the pravastatin, that, uh, at least, but not stopping statin, starting fish oil, which has no significant drug-drug interactions with the statin. And if uh, despite over-the-counter fish oil, the highest dose the patient could tolerate, the triglycerides remained over 500, uh, you could uh, prescribe the omega-3 acid ethyl ester uh, prescription drug, which incidentally uh, costs more than any of the other uh, statin therapies. So in conclusion, Benefits of the new guidelines is focused on uh, primary and secondary prevention on the basis of shared decision making with the patient. Uh, it takes attention away from the hypothetical benefits of lipid lowering with the use of non statin drugs. It focuses on important health outcomes, 
coronary events or stroke rather than the surrogate endpoints of LDL cholesterol levels. The concerns is the accuracy of the risk calculator with overestimation of risk. Suggestion by uh, some experts have been to lower the risk threshold for primary prevention uh, to uh, 10 to 15 percent from the 7.5 uh, percent cutoff, which is current. Uh, some have said maybe it's better to start with a moderate intensity statin for secondary prevention and use the shared decision approach with the patient uh, to decide about increasing. Future area of his interest is update and possible revision of a global risk calculator. Uh, we would look forward to randomized controlled trials with respect to novel uh, uh, LDL lowering therapies. Uh, the most exciting is the, uh, the monoclonal antibody blocking the uh, the uh, protein PS, PCSK9 in familial hypocholesterolemic patients, uh, uh, a genetic defect upregulating up the activity of this enzyme interferes and degrades the LDL receptor activity. So a monoclonal antibody blocking the PCSK9 ends up uh, reducing the LDL cholesterol. So the interest in this and studies now, uh, phase two and three studies have shown significant, fairly dramatic LDL lowering in patients already on maximum statin doses. The question in the future will be, does lowering the cholesterol in these patients reduce cardiac events, which would make an argument that the lower the better may in fact be true, or does it not, as we've seen with other newer cholesterol lowering therapies, such as the cholesterol ester transferase protein inhibitors, lowers cholesterol but not significantly changing risks. So with that, I'll uh, end and I'd be happy to uh, entertain questions. Steve, thank you so much. And I'll buy a new uh, battery for my laptop. There you go. This is quite complex. And one of the questions I, I would have to, I have two questions, but one of the questions I would have for you is, um, so this is complicated things to the point of, does this require a specialized clinic to do this? Can primary care doctors do this in patients who are a little bit more, comp I mean, I just thought that the, your birth patient was not complicated at all, and you complicated the hell out of it. <laughs> so, what is your recommendations about these patients? Uh, who is in, who should be in charge of the ultimate decision about their care, considering that there are millions of people who are going to be questioning this? If 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 the provider buys into the the the, the main recommendation, I think it simplifies things. Uh, ATP3 gave you all these different options, multiple drugs you could try. Niacin, you could add niacin, and that's what we did in, in the lipid clinic. Here you say they need a statin, they need the highest dose statin that they can tolerate, and uh, notice where many of these uh, uh, articles are published. They're in, in general internal medicine journals, annals, JAMA. So the answer is I think that uh, primary care would be uh, uh, actually uh, a very good uh, site to have these uh, discussions with the patients sharing uh, uh, the potential adverse effects. Now, when you get into, like the second patient, when you get into complicated and difficult to manage, uh, that's that's when uh, sure. in, inviting uh, people interested in that. The, the second question I have for you was the issue about sharing, having the patient share. When I, I've mentioned to this audience before that when I go to the mechanic, I want them to tell me what they're going to do, but I want them to tell me what needs to be done. Well, and often when I ask the patients about options, the next question is, well, what will you do? And so you present an example that went from a 7% risk to a 9% risk. So they went through the threshold of 7.5. What does that tell the patient? And, tell and how do you guide them on that? Well, it tells the patient that they have multiple risk factors. 
the, the, uh, the, the article in uh, New England Journal, which uh, just came out a couple days ago, uh, presents a single case, and then they have three lipid experts basically uh, signed, uh, like in a debate, uh, a different approach. And I, so I recommend reading that because one would not prescribe statins in that particular patient. One would, but monitor to them closely. One would, but not monitor the uh, LDL levels. And uh, so, uh, um, and, and, and they, de they deal with that very question is, the, because at the end, the hypothetical patient, uh, at the end of his discussion said to the doctor, he said, come on, what do you recommend? Which is exactly what you're saying. So I think, I think you have to, you have to, to buy into the guidelines that statins are what Krumholz calls a risk reduction pill and not a lipid-lowering agent. And if, if the pleiotropic effects are really the more important factor, then it, it simplifies things. Put them on a statin, the highest dose they can tolerate. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, they, they don't say much. They say that, uh, uh, oh, I, yes, I, I, I forgot that uh, requirement. Uh, the question was uh, what the guidelines uh, say about using omega-3. Uh, they don't have a strong recommendation for it because there are no good randomized controlled trials showing outcome benefit. It's a surrogate outcome, which is the reduction of triglycerides. But even within the guidelines, if you have triglycerides over 500, that is a, a bona fide target. So we know that you can get a 50, 40 to 50% reduction in triglycerides with the maximum uh, doses of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the omega-3 uh, oils. And uh, basically, other than a mild antiplatelet effect, they really have other, other than um, tolerability, GI effects, they have no significant side effects. So we definitely recommend them. Yes? When our society, uh, for the marketing team, the pharmaceuticals, every, every illness, real or imagined, now in the future, there's going to be an ailment, and you know, you can't wear drugs. What can we say about the ultimate positive? So the, so the question is, uh, with this emphasis on statins, what, we can, what can we do with non-statin ways to reduce risk? Again, I'll go back to this, uh, this hypothetical patient in, in the paper I discussed. Uh, he was a smoker. And uh, so part of the discussion was uh, what made his uh, pooled cohort equation risk high was the fact that he was a smoker because otherwise that particular patient didn't have any other risk factors and would not have fallen into statin recommended category. But if he quit smoking and, and, and one of the uh, hypothetical recommendations uh, was to tell the patient if you quit smoking, your risk of having uh, an MI or heart attack is going to be half of it whether or not you take a statin. So you can kind of use that as an argument that uh, the problem is their overall risk, and it's not just because their triglyceride, uh, their total cholesterol is high or their HDL is low. It's uh, because they have hypertension, because they're a smoker, diabetic, um, and other factors. So we, the, the new guidelines certainly do not minimize the importance of lifestyle changes. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Very interesting. This is a really fascinating story that it's evolving. And uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of studies done on pulmonary vascular disease and other conditions with statins. There's even tested for fibrosis. So the hypotrophic effects of these drugs is just starting to emerge.